All right. Um, oh, now I lost my train of thought. Last time we went over um, the three basic kinds of relationships that exist in relational databases. And they are, in a nutshell,
but it's, it's, it's a quick way of looking up. All right. So, for example, you have an index in the back of the book. You know, let's say you look in the back of the book and you want to look about ASP.NET validators. All right. Um, rather than flipping through the entire book, you could flip to the index in the back. Look up ASP.NET validators and it'll tell you what page it's on and you can directly jump to that. That's an index, all right? Or like in the old days, and again, I don't know how many more years I can use this analogy, but when you had card catalogs in the library, all right, you actually had, uh, you all remember those, right? Before computers? Or maybe your grandparents told you about them or, or something. Uh, but like you could look up a book a couple different ways. You could look up a book by author, you could look up a book by title, you could look up a book up by subject. And they had each, they had like a, a, a shelf of little, little cabinets for each of them. Alright, so if I knew that I was interested in, in physics, let's say, but I didn't know a specific book, I could look under physics and find that. If I knew, uh, if I didn't know the names of the books, but I wanted a book by Douglas Hofstadter, but I couldn't remember the name of any of the books he wrote. I could look it up by author. Or if I knew the, the book title itself, I could look it up. And I can jump, I can then look up quickly so I don't have to. The alternative would be I'd have to start at the first shelf and look through all the books until I found one that I wanted. All right? And that's similar in database regards, too. You know? um, databases frequently use indexes to figure out like, how to get the things in the most optimal way. So, you make a unique index. The unique part means each member of the index has to have a, a distinct, unique value. So, in other words, I could not then have that dean number one was dean of both engineering and math and sciences. When I tried to insert in the second one, it would, it, the database would complain and not let me enter that in. So, that's what a unique index is. Indexes could be not unique, too, for example. Like, here at LC, can you imagine that um, there might be an index on the student's last name, right? Because you might go in and say, well, I need to do such and such. What's your student number? I don't remember. Okay, what's your name? Or what's your phone number? Or some other piece of information. And they can then look you up by that. Well. You wouldn't want to have to look through every single person, you know, thousands of people to find that one person. It's going to jump right to you by your last name or phone number or whatever. So it's a quick look up. All right. Uh, but that wouldn't be a unique index, right? Because two people could have the same last name. Two people could even have the same combination of first name and last name. And two people could potentially share a phone number, you know. Um, that's probably less common with mobile phones, but back in the old days when your house had a phone and you didn't have a phone, uh, it would be common for two people, brother and sister or whatever, to have the same uh, phone number. So indexes can either be unique or non-unique. And the question comes in, why not have an index on everything then? So that you could look up by any factor. If indexes are so good and provide quick lookups. Why not then just create an index on every possible field? Too much. Too much. And what would the problem of too much lead to? Uh, slow to search. Okay. Too much. Takes up too much memory. Takes too much uh, uh, space. Slow. You'd slow down. It could potentially slow down. Uh, because if you want, remember when you add something to a database, you have to update all the indexes too. So. If I'm going in and adding a new student, and I have to add them and update an index by name, that's not a big deal. But if I go and update on every single field, city, state, zip code, birth date, and so on, there would be a lot of overhead in adding a student. The other thing is, with a lot of indexes, a database might get confused about what's the most efficient way to pull someone up, and it might take a, a, a wrong turn. All right. Um, and finally, you would take up extra spaces. I mean, in the library, uh, they had typically like three indexes, you know, subject, author, and um, what's the other one, title, all right? The year it was published, well, that could potentially be something that you might want to look a book up by, 
But yet, if you start adding all those things in, your card catalog's going to take up more and more and more space. And the analogy in a database is it would take up more space on, on disk. So yeah, there's extra overhead both in terms of space and in terms of time updating it. So you pick the indexes carefully. Now, a unique index is one way to implement a one, it's probably the way to implement a one-to-one -one relationship. You create a unique index, all right? A unique index is also used for what's called a candidate key, all right? Hey, we're getting into election time, so everyone knows about candidates. Everyone's thinking about candidates. What's a candidate key? Well, what's a candidate in an election? Potential position holder. A potential <laughs> position holder. Very good. All right. That's good because that also applies for a candidate key. So a candidate key is something that could be the primary key if it gets elected to that position. All right. Uh, in database terms, though, there really isn't an election. The database administrator decides, or the database designer decides what gets to be the primary key. There, there's only like one vote. <laughs> All right. Now, when I say it's a, pro it's a candidate key, what do I mean? I mean two things. It means that every member of that entity has it, and it's unique for every entity. So, a classic case of it would be a student, oh, I'm sorry, an employee number and a social security number, all right? Both of those are candidate keys, right? If I was designing a database that, that contained employee information, um, I could make the social security number the primary key or I could make the employee number the primary key. Both of those fit the rules of a primary key. What are the rules for a primary key? Everyone has one and they're unique, all right? Well, I have to pick one of them, right? It, it wouldn't do anyone any good if I like, made the combination of them. That would violate the rule that a primary key should be minimal. In other words, you don't have a two-part key if a one-part key is enough, all right? So I'd pick one. I'd probably pick employee number, all right? The other one, then, I could make a unique index for, and that would prevent me from entering two people in that have the same social security number, all right, because that's bad too. All these constraints that we're building into the database come down to the validity of the data. If you have two people with the same social security number, your data's wrong, all right? I might not know what's wrong about it, but it's wrong. That's not a valid situation. So therefore, I would need to um, go in and um, if I could apply a constraint like a unique index to prevent that from happening, um, I'm better off. What would, how would you decide which one should be the primary key if you're choosing between two candidate keys?
paycheck history, the employee's dependent information. Everywhere that we connect to an employee, we're going to use that field. Well, if we have a five-character field for employee number versus a nine versus a nine-character field for a social security number, well, five is less than nine, right? So therefore, we're going to save a little bit of space every place that we use it. All right. Lastly, numbers are better than alphanumeric. All right. And the reason for that is we can store numbers in a more efficient manner. So, short alpha short numeric fields that everyone has one and we know it's unique are the best choices for primary keys. Now, there's something that that kind of fits that criteria that we could use in just about every table, and that's an auto number. That's why most of the time I will use an auto number as a primary key. All right, because it's it's numeric, it's small, it's automatically generated. And then if anything else would have to be unique, like the employee's email address or social security number or whatever, I'd create a unique index on it. All right, so enough about primary keys and one-on-one -on -one relationships. One-to-many relationships. This is very mechanical, but you make sure that the many side has the primary key of the one side. So the many side points to the one side. Which makes sense, right? You know, in this class there's a one-to-many relationship between professor and student, right, if you're making a table. So, if I ask you all to point to the professor in the classroom, you could all point to me, right? Hopefully using this finger, right? <laughs> now, if you ask me to point to the student in this class, I couldn't do that, right? Because there's a bunch of students in the class. So, the one can't point to the many. The many can point to the one. So, in terms of databases, you're going to have a foreign key or professor ID in the course table that will point to the professor. All right? You will not just put that field in. You will define it as a foreign key. And in terms of access, that is enforcing what's called referential integrity. Referential integrity simply means that if there's a professor ID here, it has to match up with a professor ID there. Okay, has to. You can't put it in and say, well, I'll, give, I'll put in that professor later. No. You put in the professor now, and then you can put in the, the course. All right? Now, the question becomes, what happens if we delete a professor? What happens to all their courses? Well, you have a choice. Here's what, you, here's what can't happen. All right, let's describe what can't happen first, and then we can talk about our choices. I should not be able to simply delete a professor and leave their courses out there hanging, pointing to no one. All right? So, if I'm Professor 1, and frankly, what else would I be? If there was a course here... They had a professor ID of one. All right. And this is for fall of 2016, let's say. And since Dr. Church reti is retiring at the end of June, maybe I apply for the presidency of the college. All right. And of course, if I did that, I'd. I'd I'm sure I'd, I'd get it hands down. That, that's not a question. All right. So I would then be deleted from the professor file. 
I'm trying to think of a scenario that would cause me from deleted to be deleted from the professor file without having me like be fired or dying or anything like that. So I tried to think of a pleasant example. Or let's say I hit the lottery and, and I decide to retire. Okay, you could not simply delete me from here and leave these two out here pointing to professor ID of one that doesn't exist. That's not valid. That violates referential integrity. And the database simply won't let you do that. All right? So you have choices. All right? Your choices, and again, depending on the specific database, sometimes there's a couple extra choices. But the two main choices you have is restrict deletion or cascade deletion. All right? Restrict deletion means that you simply can't delete someone. In this case, you could not delete a professor if they have a course out there. Or, in fact, if, if there was any table that they were related to where there was a member of. Simply can't do it. You try to delete them, it'll tell you. You can't delete this person. All right? You can't delete this person. And again, that's not a control you have to build into your program. If you define a database correctly and define the constraints correctly, then no matter how the database is accessed, you will not be able to delete that person. One advantage of databases compared to silo sort of files or flat files is with flat files where everything was sort of separated, I could have a bunch of programs accessing a bunch of data. But they worked independently. So I would have to implement the rules in all the places. So if I messed up and I didn't check to see if a professor had classes before I deleted them, I might be able to delete a professor um, and leave the classes out there hanging. I worked in a system that was like this, and it was amazing when we did some checking to find out. And again, it wasn't done intentionally, but just over time, bugs happen. People change one thing and forget to change the other, and so on. But we had so many products out there, or I'm sorry, so many orders out there for invalid products. Or we had so many orders for invalid customers. And it was a real mess. With a database, however, every request of the database goes through the DBMS, more or less. DBMS stands for Database Management System. It's a program that allows you to access and manipulate the data in a database. The rules are enforced here. The database is a gatekeeper to the data, which means that if the constraints are defined correctly, no one can do something bad to the data without going through the DBMS. So the constraint that you have to have a um, valid professor number on a course you won't be able to delete a professor if there's courses out there. All right? There's no, like, sort of and run where you can sneak in that way and delete the person. All your requests are going to go more or less through the DPMS. It's a little different for access, but we can consider that to be similar. So that's one option, is to restrict deletion. The other option is to cascade. Uh, deletions. And cascade would mean that if you delete a professor, it takes all the courses out there with them. So if you were to delete professor one, it would wipe out all the courses associated with professor one. That's the other option. What option sounds to be better in this case? To restrict or delete? Restrict, right? Because if I am named president of the college, in starting next July, and they delete me from the president table, the courses that I was planning on teaching are still going to go on. All right? They're just going to 
get assigned a different professor. All right. So they wouldn't allow my row, the database would not allow my row to be deleted from the professor table until all my courses were reassigned. All right. Now keep in mind, you could write a slick program to do that. You know, you could write an application that if you try to delete someone, it displays a message that says, you can't delete this professor. They're teaching these classes. And then have drop downs to say, who do you want to assign these classes to? And you could go and assign yeah, this class to Norad, this class to Huffman, this class to Harms. Click the button, boom, those classes get assigned to the new professors, and my row gets deleted. So interface-wise, you could do things to make the administrator of the database's life easier. But from a database perspective, it's either restrict or cascade. Now, cascade would be probably, in this case, not a good idea because you would go and delete the, all the courses and, you know, as, as much as I like to think that I bring a lot to the table, these classes, if I were not here, they would still go on, all right? Now, keep in mind that cascading delete only works from the one to the many direction. From the many to the one, there's no issue. So, for example, if CISS 216 was canceled, we could delete that from the table, and we're not going to go out and delete the professor just because their course is canceled, all right? So the deletion only works if we're talking about deleting the one and there are children associated with that row in the database. And again, if you remember the reason for this, hey, if you delete CISS 216, that can be done without any issue as far as referential integrity. Everything still points and lines up correctly. Now what would be a case can anyone think of a case where you might want to cascade, delete something? Forget about this example, just in any situation. Can you think of a case where you would want to cascade, delete some relationship? Like um, eliminate some part of your inventory, like something in this, this. Smaller businesses? Oh, okay. Uh, if, I del if I eliminate part of my inventory, good example. So let's say I am a sporting goods store, and I have um, brands of bats, and you stop carrying one certain brand of bat. Exactly. If I stop carrying Spalding sporting goods, so I could delete out that manufacturer from my manufacturer table, and it could go and wipe out all the items for that. All right. You mentioned like a smaller business, yeah. and and how so with that? Okay. If you delete some to you, the only one who has the access of the whole thing. So maybe it was not a good example. Um, <laughs> I think we could turn it into a good example, though, for uh, be, because your design really, I mean, there's there's differences in design when you're talking about a big or small organization, but even if it's a small organization, I wouldn't want to delete um, an employee and take out a bunch of stuff with them, you know. Um, I wouldn't want to delete a sales rep and take out all the customer reps, all the, all the customers that that sales rep served, for example. But what about orders? Um, a customer comes in and says that, that they, um, you know, they want to order five of these and six of these and seven of these, and then they call back and say, you know what, we realize we don't have any money to pay you, so cancel those orders. Cancel that order, all right? If I were to delete the order, it should delete all the information about the order, all right, because I'm canceling the order. So that may be spread out through at least a couple of tables. There might be an order table, there might be a, a order line item table, and so on. So if I delete the order, I want to take out all the line items because I'm not going to say, hey, you can't delete this order because there's items associated with it. Well, of course there's items associated with it. It's an order, all right. So when you delete the order, you might get rid of all the items that are on that order as well. All right, so that would be an example of cascade. All right, lastly, one-to-many, or I'm sorry, many-to-many, 
becomes two one-to-manys. And you have choices as far as a primary key goes for that intersecting table. That's known as an intersecting entity or an intersecting table. You could make the primary key just the primary, you could make the primary key of the intersecting table the primary key of each of the tables taken together. So we ran into this example last time, if I remember, with our three students and three courses. And student one maybe was taking course one, student one was taking course three, and student two was taking course two, and student three was taking course two and three. I could make the combination of these the primary key. Primary key can be multiple columns if, if needed. All right, It has to be unique, but it could be that the combination is unique. Now, uh, for that to be a primary key, that combination would have to be unique, and there could never be an instance where there was one without the other. So, for example, each one of these rows in this table will need both a student ID and a course ID. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because that's the whole purpose of this table is to match up students and courses. Now, for each one of those, I would go and set up the delete conditions. Was it restricted or cascaded? All right. The relationship between course and student courses. Would I cascade delete that or would I restrict delete that? Course to, course to, from course to student course. Because remember, you go through that intermediary table, that intersecting table. Well, cascade. pardon me? I would probably cascade, and, and many of you probably have had this experience, or some of you. What happens when, you know, it's like the week before the end of the semester and only two people are enrolled in the course? Well, sorry, the course gets canceled, right? It gets deleted. What would happen to your row in the student course table? It will get deleted too, all right? Now, hopefully they've called you and said we're going to do this, all right? But you wouldn't want to have to go in and take out every student from the course and then delete the course. You'd want to delete the course and just take out all the students. Now, does that mean that you would get deleted? No. no. Because again, it only goes from the one to the many. It wouldn't go that way. The, the cascade delete would not extend that way. Uh, and probably similar between student and courses. If a student were to drop out of school, if they were registered for classes, you'd probably get rid of all their registrations as well. Now, I said you have choices here. The student course, again, if we're talking about one semester, the student course, the combination of student and course ID itself is going to be unique. Like I said before, no matter how much you enjoy this course, you're not going to enroll for it twice. You know, I like that course so much, I'm going to pay twice the tuition for it and get do the work, turn in the assignments two times and, and all that. All right? It doesn't really make sense. So these two could be the primary key. In other cases, though, you might want, the combination won't necessarily be, um, um, the situation won't necessarily be that that will be unique for each of these. For example, uh, the example I gave towards the end of class, I think it was actually after the class finished, I was just talking to a student. The relationship between Facebook post and comment, and, and, and Facebook post and user comments. If I made the user ID and the Facebook post ID the primary key, that I couldn't have one person make more than one comment on a Facebook post. All right? Because if I tried to put that another row in there that had the same, for the same Facebook post, the same
same user ID, because it's a primary key, it wouldn't let it. So what would I do? I could do something like make a comment ID, which was just an auto number, and then I could have duplicates for the user ID and Facebook ID. Now sometimes there's going to be extra attributes too. For student course, there might be a grade associated with it. In this table, there might be the text of the comment that the person made and so on. So there's a little bit of judgment there, but one thing that you know for sure is that this needs a foreign key to point to this, and this needs a foreign key to point to that. All right, let's now go into, are there any questions about this? I alluded to the normalization rules. The normalization rules to summarize that no repeating fields. So I wouldn't simply have a list of course IDs in a student table, all right, because I don't know how many to put in there. Stuff depends on the entire primary key. I would not put the student's name here, because the student's name only depends on what student you're talking about, the student ID. It doesn't depend on, you don't have a different name in each class. And finally, I wouldn't put the professor name here because the professor name depends on the professor ID, which is not the primary key of this table, but it's the primary key of that table. All right, let's look at our call center example, and let's go and expand the database to add a call, a call table. And we'll do this a bit at a time. I know when we initially designed this, we had a whole bunch of tables here. But we'll expand this one at a time. What would the relationship between customer and call be? One to many. First of all, that's always a good guess because that's the most common one. So if you don't if you don't know any better, yell that out. Well, again, we need to consider it going both directions. One customer has how many calls? Could have many calls, right? It's not like if you are calling in for support. I'm sorry, you will called in once. You called in Thursday. Therefore, the fact that your computer blow up. Sorry, we can't take your call about that. All right? Um, on the other hand, each call is going to be for how many customers? I'm taking a call with more than one customer on the phone. But <laughs> <laughs> it should be just one customer. Right. Right. It should be. In other words, it's not going to be like, you know, Bob's not going to call and say, Hi, this is Bob. I'm having a problem with my, um, you know, video um, card, and I also got Fred on the line here, and he has a problem. It's like, no, Fred, call in yourself, right? Come on, Fred. So there's going to be a one-to-many relationship. So what does that mean? What do I put in what? I will put the customer ID then in the call table, right? Because the many side points to the one. So if I'm going to go in the database here, I'm going to make a call table. So I'm going to go create table. I'm going to go into design mode. I'm going to call it call. I'm going to use a unique auto number ID for it. All right, why not? What, what we, could, we talked about other possibilities for a primary key of a call, right? We could use a combination of the customer number and the date and the time that they made the call, thinking that no person could be calling the same customer, or no person could be calling, uh, making two calls at the exact same time. And that might be good. Again, if 
if we expand our thinking to think that a customer could be a corporation where a couple people could be calling in with problems, all right, then maybe that isn't such a good assumption. You know what? I'm going to just make my life easier and just make a auto number key. You will see me do that a lot. All right. I'll typically use the name of the table and ID as a primary key, and it's going to be an auto number key if I'm doing access. So I'm going to put in the call date time, which is a date time. Should it be required? Yeah, it doesn't make sense that someone called. When did they call? Oh, I don't know. Could have been 2008. Could have been five minutes ago. All right. Do I want to index it? Maybe, maybe not. You'd have to know more about the problem to decide that. Is that something that you would you would look up um, by and want to see all the calls for a given day? Maybe you would, maybe you wouldn't. All right. I would think it would probably be better to index by like things in the customer table. Like, okay, uh, you don't remember your customer number, but what's your name? And I'll, I'll look you up that way. All right, so there will be a, I'm just going to add a description of problem. And I could make it a short text or a long text. I'll make it a long text. All right. Required? Yeah. They're probably not calling just to say hi. All right. Now, we could add other things to this, too. And as we build this database, we might come back and, and alter it to add some more things, like who's the name of the person that took the call? All right. Um, what product was the call related to? You know, we might have a product table that says that this person has this product, so they're calling in to talk about their laptop as opposed to their desktop or something like that. But for now, we'll stick with just these fields. But to implement the relationship, we need a customer ID. Now, we, it needs to match up with the value in the customer table. In the customer table, the customer ID was an auto number. Therefore, we make it a number here, not an auto number. All right, because it's not like the first call is for customer one, the second call is for customer two, the third call is for customer three. We're going to put in the right customer number, all right, but um, it has to be a number. All right. And is it required? Yeah, I would say it is required. Now it's smart. I think it's smart. It sees the word ID and it thinks this might be a foreign key. So it's already telling me, yeah, you can have duplicates here. You can have, uh, we're going to make an index and we're going to have duplicates. Which would make sense, right? A customer could have more than one call, so you should be allowed to have duplicates. Okay. Is our job done here? Yes. No. Or job was done on that screen, if that's what you meant is correct. What do we need to do? We need to define that as a foreign key. Did we not do that in the previous screen? No, we did not. We simply created a field that coincidentally, or not coincidentally, but has the same name as the primary key of the customer table. That does not make it a foreign key. What makes it a foreign key in Access is going into database tools, into relationships, picking the two tables, and going like this. Dragging this guy to this guy. And more than that, clicking Enforce Referential Integrity. Cascade Update Related Fields, that's similar to Cascade Delete. We're going to ignore that. Cascade Delete 
If a customer leaves us and we delete them, do we want to take all their calls out too? Yeah, forget them. If they're no longer our customer, we don't care what they called in about. That's someone else's problem now. So I'm going to cascade delete. So now we've defined that as a foreign key. So as a foreign key, I have customer number one, two, three, four. If I go in and try to say that today someone called with a broke monitor and it was customer number 12, it's not going to let me do it. And it's not just through this program. If I created an ASP.NET site to log these calls, all right, it would not let me put that in if it didn't have a valid customer number. So I can put in that customer 4 has it. All right. Also today, um, Say they have internet connection issues. Customer three has that. All right. Now you might say, gee, that's awful clunky. The fact that you have to know those customer IDs. That wasn't that big a deal for me. All right, because I don't, I'm not really interested in doing this accurately. I'm just, I just want to make sure the data is valid. I'm just making up, putting in a valid customer number. Well, keep in mind, this is not how people are going to enter data into this table. This is sort of the back end looking at the database. All right? You're going to build apps that are going to be user friendly and are going to have drop downs and stuff like that so that the user can um, go in and, and see, um, see um, everything related to them. All right. So. Let me close out of here. If I go and delete customer number four, this is warning us that if we delete customer four, we're taking the calls out with us. All right. Are you sure you want to delete this? If I answer yes, then there's only one call now, and that call is gone. Why is that? Because of cascaded deletion. Now, if I go back and change this to restrict deletion, I change it by clicking on that, and I change that not to cascade, and I go and try to delete Mary here, it'll tell me you can't do that because there's restrict deletion. And again, the nice thing is, is it's not just this program I would get that error. I would get that error anywhere. Any application to try to access this would, would have that same issue. I'm going to leave it as restrict, you know, just for the heck of it. You know, just so that I don't accidentally delete data, all right, as, as I'm, I'm doing this. All right, so we'll leave it as, as restrict. Questions at this point? Yes. The only thing I just want to point out that I like is that you deleted like call one. So now if you go back into the calls, like there is no one anymore for the auto number. Like that one has gone. So now it just starts at two. Yes. So I like, like the same one. Okay. Get rid of. Yeah. It, it, uh, again, uh, some people are concerned about that, but you're not going to run out of numbers. So you're okay. All right. All right. Here's what I want to do next. I want to show a list of customers and their call information. Okay? So, I, or, or let me rephrase that. I want to see a list of all the calls that were made, but show the customer information along with the call information. In other words, who made this call? Well, customer three did. Well, I don't know, gee, who's customer number three? Well, customer three is 
Mary Johnson. All right? So I want to show that Mary Johnson called and it's having internet connectivity issues. All right, so I want to merge the data together. Remember, the things that we've talked about so far in this class relate to making sure the data is, has integrity, that it has consistency, that all the data is in one place, that the relationships exist and the relations are implemented correctly. That helps us ensure that we have accurate data. And if our data isn't accurate, it helps us ensure that it's very least consistent and it's easy to correct. The other big advantage of using relational databases is we can combine stuff. So in the example we went over a couple classes ago, I pulled up simply a list of customers. Now I want to pull up a list of call information and show also show the customer information. So I'm going to go and do that, except this time I'm not going to take the automated way. I'm going to actually write the SQL statement by hand. All right. SQL is the language of databases. It allows us within an application to do database queries, to do database inserts, updates, and deletes. Anything that you can do to a database, there are SQL commands for. So what I want to show is I want to show the name of the customer, or the name of the problem, uh, a description of the problem, and then the name of the customer. I want, to, I want a screen that shows that for all my calls. And let me go in and put a couple more calls in. Say, customer 2 has a problem that their screen is blank. Exactly. I did that on purpose because of that. Number two has a problem that their printer doesn't work. That's actually the solution to all these. Try rebooting. All right. So we'll say Mary also has that problem. So we now have three calls in here. All right. So let's go and let's build a page that accesses these three calls. Now, one thing before we do that, if you get an error creating a foreign key, there's three possibilities, two or three depending on how you count it, possibilities of what's wrong. One is that the types of data of the keys don't match. So, for example, if it's an auto number in one table, it needs to be a number in the other. If it's a text field in the, in the second field, you can't match a text to an auto number. So we'll complain about that. We'll complain if there's a different number of fields. For example, if the primary key in one table has two fields, and you're trying to say the foreign key only has one, well, that's not enough to connect to that other table. You need both of the key fields. And the third reason is if the data, if the, if the table already has invalid data in it. So if I created a call for customer number 99 and that doesn't exist, and then I tried to add the foreign key in, it would not allow me to add the foreign key in because there's already bogus data in there. So it's best to define the keys before you start entering data because that will keep you honest and make sure that the data that you enter has integrity. All right, so let's go into ASP.NET. Here's the example we had last time, and again, remember the connection string should look like this and have the word data directory, and that data directory should be app underscore data. It does now. <laughs> I, I, for, I forgot to upload the change version I made last time, so I downloaded it, rechanged it, I just forgot to hit refresh here. So let's go and let's make a new page. So I'll make a new file. Web form. We'll call this calls.
keep in mind again I know this is I know this is bad to say these words but I'm gonna say them anyhow do as I say not as I do all right your pages should look like complete web pages so you should spend some attention to the way that it looks that being said we've already talked about creating CSS and all that so when I do these examples just in the interest of time I'm not going to spend a lot of time styling the pages I'm just going to do the functionality aspect of it so I get to do that because I'm the teacher I know it's not fair but it wasn't fair when I was on the other side of the desk and I was a student and the teacher was able to use that excuse too so it cycles around all right okay so remember for database interactivity, I'm going to have two main components. I'm going to have the visual component, which is how I'm going to represent the data. And then I'm going to have um, the actual data source component. So I can do this in either order. I'm going to make the grid view first. And a grid view is simply a table. It's good at showing multiple rows from a database. So in this case, I'm going to show all the calls. So, um, you know, it will uh, it will uh, show me, you know, all the calls. So that's going to be probably more than one. All right. I'm going to create a new data source. Now, we get our data from SQL database. Now, here's an important thing. It's asking us what connection string do we want to use. The very first time we did this, I clicked on new connection. All right. We don't want to do that here because we've already defined a connection string. This is coming from the same database as the other page did. So I don't want to create a new connection string. I ought to have just one connection string per database. So I don't want to, for my second page, I don't want to create a new connection string. I don't want three or four things pointing to the same database. Why not? Well, again, the whole philosophy of software development is trying to do things so that when you need to change them, you only need to change them in one place. So therefore, I will not click new connection. Instead, I will pick connection string from the drop down because that's what I called the connection string before. Next. Now I define a SQL statement and we could use the sort of GUI tool to generate the SQL statement but I think it's important that you at least have a working knowledge of SQL itself. So we're going to go in and we're going to write the actual SQL statement for this. All right, so I'm going to click on select, specify custom SQL statement. And here's where we write in our SQL statement. And I'm going to, I'm going to type it in and test it to make sure it's right, because I'd hate to explain to you why this is the right SQL statement and find out it wasn't the right SQL statement. All right, so I'm going to go in and write the SQL statement, and then we'll go back and say why, explain to you the parts of it. So select customer name, call date. Notice that SQL isn't case sensitive, so if I don't pay attention to case, 
it's not going to be too bothered by it. doesn't like the fact that I have these tables out. Alright, so there we go. That SQL statement is working. So let's go and I'm going to copy it and paste it in a notepad so that we can take a closer look at it. thing is, again, is you can put it on multiple lines and so on. The statement that does queries is called a select statement. So, Tuesday of next week, when we write another query and I say, how are we going to start this off? Just yell select. Then you'll get the answer out of the way and then I'll look to other people for the hard parts of the question. And you will have, you will have, have uh, uh, you know, successfully impressed me that, that you remembered um, that part. So, select means choose from the database. Show me this from the database. We then have a list of column names that are in the database. They're separated by commas. These column names need to be in, not just anywhere in the database, but I need to put in the from clause the tables from which those columns are in. So for example, if I tried to do this, it wouldn't work. It doesn't figure out the call date time is in the call table. Because I could have a call date time in another table. All right. So you have to say what table your columns come from. All right. Your columns anywhere in your SQL statement. Yes? It doesn't matter. I think the order. The sequence does not matter. As long as you put them in there, it's there. As long as they're there. Then it knows where to look. Yep. Keep in mind that, you know, some databases, not rare for databases, have hundreds of tables. So it's not going to figure out what table you mean. All right? You tell it what table you mean, or it says forget it. <laughs> you know? Now, Notice that I simply have the column name. I simply have a column name of customer name. Think of it like with people. All right, With people, I could refer to you by your first name or by your first name and last name. Now, there's no one in here that has the exact same name, I don't believe. So this example will hold through. All right? But, if I were to say, Alan, raise your hand. Okay, <laughs> I was going to say, your name is Alan, right? I was starting to get worried there. All right? I was able to do that, right? And I was able to, to know exactly... You guys do exactly who I meant. Why? Because I wanted one person named Alan. All right? So I can use your first name if you're the only person that has that first name. All right? Now, Mike, raise your hand. Ooh. So if I said Mike, that's not going to work, right? Because there's two Mikes in here. Which Mike do I mean? All right. 
Now, forgetting the power, uh, the fact that I don't usually talk about myself in the third person, all right, but I could be, right? Um, in that case, I would need to specify the full name of the person so there'd be no ambiguity, right? So I say Mike Zellers, and now we know, now we got the one person, all right? Same thing with database columns, except sort of the first name and last name is reversed. The first name of the column is the column name itself. So customer name, call date time, description of problem. I can use just the, the, the column name because these columns only appear in one of these two tables. In other words, customer name's in the customer table. There's nothing called customer name in the call table. Call date time only appears in the call table. There is no call date time in the customer table. Description of problem only appears in the call table. There is no description of problem in the customer table. The full name of a column, however, is its table name. followed by the column name. So I could do that. All right. Just like I could use someone's first name and last name, even if they were the only person in the room that had that name. Yes? Do you need customer, like from customer? Do you, do you still need that? You, you still need that, yes. Oh. Even if I say customer dot customer name, I still need to say from customer. So what is, put, what is putting customer in front of the customer name? Uh, what does that accomplish? Good question. It, it makes it absolutely clear. It helps you understand where the fields are coming from. Okay. So sometimes that's valuable. And what about customer ID? Customer ID is in both tables. So I need to specify that I want to look at the customer ID in the customer table, and I want to match it up with the customer ID in the call table. So it's the table name dot whatever. Table name dot whatever. Right. Now, what does that part say where customer dot customer ID equals call dot customer ID? That's telling the database how to match up customer and call. In other words, how do I link those two tables together? They're linked together by virtue of the fact that they have the same customer ID. All right? Now, this is, I guess this is, this is one of those things that you may think it's kind of weird that you have to do this, but you do. All right? You have to, even though you've defined the foreign key and defined the relationship, you still in your SQL statement have to say how to match up customers and and calls. You just do. All right. Probably the idea is, is that while that's what you want to do most of the time, the creators of SQL probably didn't want to limit you if you wanted to do things in a different way. All right. So what this will do is this will literally look up the calls and it will say for this person, the customer number is ID, uh, customer ID is three. Therefore, I will match up this call with Mary. This call I match up with Fred. This call I also match up with Mary. So it does it the same way you would be doing it if you had like sheets of paper or spreadsheets. If you saw on a sheet of paper that customer uh, two has this problem, you'd go to the customer list and find customer two. Okay, that's the customer that has this problem. Okay? Now, when you match them up, you have to say that I want to match up the customer ID in the one table with the customer ID in the other table. All right? Now, there's other ways to match up. There's other ways. This is called joining tables. There's other ways to join tables, but this, in my mind, is a simpler way, so we're going to start off doing this. So let's finish this out. All right. And let me go and run it. See what I get.
I get just what I'd expect. Customer, Mary, call date and time, internet connection issues, and so on down the line. Now let's do a couple things with this. First of all, let me show you what happens if you don't join them together. I'm going to eliminate the WHERE clause. And the WHERE clause is one way that joins them together. What do you think happens if I don't specify a WHERE clause? If I say I want this table and that table, but I don't say how they're connected? It shows everything, but worse than that. It shows every row in, table, in, in, in the call table combined, matched up with every row in the customer table. So it's going to show me that every customer has every problem. All right. So if I hit next and test, notice what I get. Gee, Bob Jones has internet connection problems. So does Fred. So does Mary. Bob Jones also has a screen blank. So does Fred. So does Mary. And so on down the line. In database terms, that's known as a cross product. All right. So if you have 10 elements in one table and five in the other, there's going to be 50 rows in the output. Because it's going to take each of those 10 and match it up with each of those five. So if you don't explicitly say how to match up the rows in this table with the rows in that table, it says, I don't know how to match them up, so it must be matched up with everyone. This problem must belong to everyone since there's no rule. Again, that's just, you know, that's just how it works. There probably are situations where you would want to do that, maybe. But typically you don't. You do want to match them up. So I'm going to go in and put that back in. showing the customer to which it belongs. The other thing you notice is that this isn't in a particularly usable order. All right? It's probably in order based on the call number. All right? um, probably. But that isn't necessarily useful. All right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put an order by clause. Select statement at least is going to have a select and a from clause. I can't see there ever being a select statement without, oh, I'm sure you could think of some crazy exception. It's going to have a select and it's going to have a from clause. These other clauses come into play as needed. So in this case, I probably want to order by customer name, and then by call date and time. So it will show me the customers in alphabetical order, and within each customer it will show me from the oldest to the newest call. That seems to be a reasonable thing to do. So there Fred goes first. They all have the same date, so it really doesn't, really not clear, but it shows those that way. So the order by allows you to control the order that this is going to appear in. Typically, you want to use an order by, because otherwise, the database is going to return it in the order that it wants to. So it goes in, in alphabetical or numeric order based on the field you name? Depends on the kind of field it is. 
So if it is a alphabetic field like customer name is, it'll be alphabetical order. If it was a numeric field, like if I showed the sequence by age of the customer or something like that, then it would go in numeric order. If it's in date, it would be in chronological order and so on. Does anyone mind if I take five more minutes to go over something? If you do mind, you know, feel free to, you know, leave and you can watch the video later. But I, I like to, because especially given that we missed last Thursday, I like to do one more thing. All right? And that is, what if I didn't want to see everyone's, but I wanted to see just a certain person's? All right? So let's say I want where I can type in a person's name and see all of their calls. Or for that matter, I could put in a date and see all, of the, all the calls for that day or something like that. All right. Let's go and do that. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a text box on here. And I'm going to put a button. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the name of the person that I want. Alright? Name of the person that I want. And then it will show me only the calls for that person. What do I need to change to make that happen? Do I need to change the grid view or do I need to change the SQL data source? SQL data source, because that's what supplies the data. I'm not changing the way it looks. I still want it to look the same way. I just want different data to be populated. I don't want to see everyone. I just want to see certain people or a certain person. So I'll go into the SQL data source, configure data source. Now. Where do I put that little snippet of code to only show me the one customer? Um, no. Actually, it's part of the where clause. The where clause is what limits what you see. So we saw before how matching it up limits what we see to the appropriate matching. If I only want one customer, I will say and customer name equals, well equals what? Well, I don't know. It depends what they've typed in. Alright? So if I typed in Joe, I want to see Joe's. If I type in Bill, I want to see Bill's. Alright? What I want then is I want what's called a parameter. A parameter is a blank that we're going to fill in at runtime. All right. So where their customer name equals something, and we're going to get that value from the text box. So the way you put in a parameter is by putting in a question mark. In other words, I'm going to fill that in later. All right. It's going to be different each time, right? It's going to be based on whatever the value is in that text box. I then go and notice that I get an extra screen in here. The wizard has detected one or more parameters in your select statement. I just picture like Gandalf or something say, that select statement appears to have a parameter. I better display the screen. What do you have to do? Well, you got to say where that parameter is coming from, right? If you're not specifying the exact value, you have to say, well, here's where you're going to get the value. And in our case, we're going to get that value from a control. All right? From that text box. Now, what control do we want? Well, there's really only one reasonable choice, text box. And now we go in and test the query. It's first going to ask us for 
a name. Let me make sure I got the name right. Fred Smith. So if I supply Fred Smith, it shows us just that one call. So I'm going to hit finish. Now when I run this, starts off showing nothing at first. I type in Fred Smith, click the button, and there you go. You just have that one. What's another person? It's Mary Johnson. So that's as a parameterized query, all right? So that takes a value from something and plugs it into the SQL statement. Because certainly you wouldn't want to have to create a separate page for every customer. This is Mary's list of calls. This is Bill's list of calls. This is Sue's list of calls. You'd want one page where you can supply who the customer is, and it will show you the list of calls. Now, here's your challenge for next time. You don't have anything to do, and you're bored. It's supposed to be cold this weekend, right? You may even get snow. snow. No. No. Yeah. No. All right. So, what better way to warm your hearts than to stay inside and do some programming, right? Try to write this same search using a drop down instead of a text box. That is our challenge, and we'll take that on on Tuesday of next week. That'll be the first thing that we do. All right? Okay, we'll see you in lab.